It's wonderful to see you this morning. Um, beautiful fall day. Just gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Uh, we could we could deal with this for several days in a row, and I don't think anybody would complain. Huh? So, I want to thank both uh, Marvin and uh, Marty for kind of setting the stage a little bit for the message this morning. Just did a great job with uh, scripture and prayer and communion meditation, and just uh, really, uh, we didn't talk about this. The Lord does this all the time anyway, but we didn't talk about this. Um, they just set the, the stage, ideally, for this final spiritual discipline we're going to talk about today. Uh, as was mentioned by both the gentlemen, it's been a, been a difficult year, a year that's easy to focus on all kind of negative things. Um, but our discipline today is not that. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. We, uh, we know this verse. Uh, every time we come across it, it just it rings true with us. And uh, so it's just, it's very fitting, I think, that we, that we uh, close our sermon series on spiritual disciplines with this particular one. And by the way, I'll refresh your memory again. Next week we begin a sermon series on the book of Job. Uh, but Job has 42 chapters. We're not going to do 42 sermons or 400 and some sermons, as you could probably figure it. But, so we're only going to hit some of the high spots. We'll do that over a period of several weeks as we run into it toward the end of the year. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I, I will say it again. Rejoice. In uh, 1980, there was a pop group called Cool in the Gang. Anybody ever heard of Cool in the Gang? Wow! We can we can have a sing along this morning. We didn't sing any worship songs, so we can sing this song. Another song. There's a party going on right here. A celebration to last throughout the years. So bring your good times and your laughter too. We're going to celebrate your party with you. Celebration. Let's all celebrate and have a good time. Celebration. We're going to celebrate and have a good time. Someone wrote of that uh, great pop tune. It's a great pop tune. Just really, really so good. But someone wrote about it. It's that it's that sort of equal opportunity approach to party, uh, to party starting that allowed celebration to soundtrack pretty much any joyous festivity imaginable in the 40 years following its release. In 1981 alone, it was used both as a theme song for Super Bowl 15 between the Oakland Raiders and the Philadelphia Eagles and the song that heralded the return of the 52 American citizens to the United States soil at the end of the Iran hostage crisis. And over the decades, it has not only endured as an anthem of such moments of victory, but also became a go-to song for disc jockeys at nearly every, every wedding and bar mitzvah and uh, confirmation and large-scale gathering that there was indeed a cause for celebration. The world often celebrates, but oftentimes it doesn't know what it's celebrating. It doesn't know why it's celebrating, nor does it even know how to celebrate. In, uh, well, I won't say what year, uh, roughly 20 years ago, a sports team was defeated in the semifinals of the Final Four. And the students on the campus of that school were so angry that they went out and did $500,000 worth of damage to their campus. The following year, that team won the championship. They again went out and did thousands of dollars worth of damage to their campus. I won't call their name, but they're no longer in the Atlantic Coast Conference. Um, sometimes they celebrate things, things are celebrated that's fleeting and does not last. And it's produced from some kind of outside happiness, if you will. Christianity, on the other hand compared to the world, often do, we don't celebrate what we do know. That's why the positivity this morning that both Marvin and, 
and Marty talked about in their messages is so important right now. There's plenty in the world to mourn over. There's evil and tragedy and upheaval, and this year especially has been tough. But, but the discipline that we want to talk about this morning is the discipline of celebration. Now, some of us may not may have more of a problem with this than others and might not be thinking that this is a discipline, but Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says that celebration is at the heart of the way of Christ. It's, it's where it begins. In fact, you may remember the announcement of the coming of Jesus to the shepherds in the field. Luke chapter 2 verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great what? Joy. That will be for all the people. Jesus himself talked about this in John chapter 15. This is even after he went through the sorrow of uh, the Last Supper with his disciples and telling them what was going to happen to him. Here's what he said in John 15 verse 11. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Celebrate. In the book of Ecclesiastes, you remember in that third chapter where the writer gives that uh, big long list of things uh, about the, uh, we have time for this and time for that, time to uh, be born and time to die. In verse 4 it says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. I hope folks know the difference, but also a time to mourn and a time to dance. Unfortunately, in many instances, the church has been removing genu- genuine celebration from the kingdom for centuries. It's sometimes viewed as somehow unspiritual or unbecoming of believers to, to celebrate. And so uh, let's think of it in terms of the spiritual discipline. And I'm going to try to answer about three questions for us this morning that will help us understand a little bit more about it. First of all, why should we celebrate? Well, one of the primary reasons we should celebrate is because we have two specific divine models for celebration. Okay? Two specific divine models. The first one is God himself. Spoken as Marvin prayed this morning. Genesis chapter 1. When God's creating everything, remember what he said when he got done with different things? Oh, it's good stuff here. It's good stuff. You find it in verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, 21, 30, 25, and 31. Every time God said, it's it's good stuff. And I wonder if he walked around high-fiving himself, you know. Or maybe sought out the Holy Spirit and high-fived him. Or the the Word, pre-existent form of Jesus Christ, and high-fived him. This is good stuff we got here. God was pleased when Israel and certain individuals in the Old Testament did right and he celebrated with them and praised them. In the New Testament, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says as soon as Jesus was baptized, he came out of, when he came, went up out of the water at that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him and a voice from heaven said what? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. High-fiving all around. It's time for high-fiving. That's the first divine model. We also have Jesus as a divine model of celebration. When he began his ministry, in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he says, said this to the group that he stood up and, re- and read to, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Wow! How much more celebratory can you get than that? We also uh, celebrate with him at the first miracle he ever performed at, uh, at the wedding in Cana, right? Uh, you know, uh, everything is getting kind of dull because they're running out of the, the wine and, you know... There's no more wine. What are we going to do here? Jesus, and Jesus' mother comes to him and says, We've got to fix this. You've got to fix this. Okay, let's celebrate. Numerous parties and dinners throughout the scripture where Jesus went and ate in, in people's homes and, and, and uh, experienced celebration. So we should celebrate because we have at least two divine models for this. We also should celebrate because celebration empowers us. In the book of Nehemiah, uh, in the 8th chapter, it says that Ezra, the prophet, or the priest, got up to, to read from, the, from the, uh, the Word of God. And when he's reading from the Word of God, everybody's overcome with grief. And if you read in verse 9, you'll see that, that Ezra said, look, don't, don't grieve. Or Nehemiah says to him, don't, don't grieve. Look, 
look, this is, uh, th there's nothing wrong with this. Verse 10 says this. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have prepared nothing. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you, if you want things to, to, to really turn around, if you want to have the energy you need, joy is what's going to produce it. This idea of celebration. We also find that Israel's national gatherings and their covenant days produce celebration for them. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 22 through 29, it's a very interesting text there that a lot of people have never paid much attention to, I doubt, other than just reading it. But the Bible says there in that particular place that the reason that the tithe was brought to the household of God was so people could party. You bring your tithe and you, and you make certain there's plenty of food and we're just going to have a big old party. There's a great celebration. Interestingly enough, we often think that the, the, the tithe is what belongs to the Lord and the rest of it belongs to us to do as we please. And actually in the Old Testament, the tithe was, was sent for the purpose of the people partying and the other 90% you were responsible for. Celebration empowers us. Celebration brings joy. Not just any celebration. There are certain kinds of celebration that do it. The celebration of obedience is top among that. And, and uh, an occasion in Jesus' life points this out. In Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and 28, Jesus is teaching. The Bible says, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd yelled out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and who nursed you. So essentially she's saying, let's celebrate your mom, Jesus. Now, we do that, don't we? About the second Sunday of every May, we celebrate moms. Well, let's celebrate your mom, Jesus. Jesus responds with these words. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Let's celebrate those who listen and those who obey. Those are the people that we need to be celebrating. It's interesting, isn't it? That the people who get celebrated most often now are not the people who are listening and obeying, but the people who are in defiance of God. Celebration brings us joy, but it's not a manufactured celebration. Again, Richard Foster in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says, It is important to avoid the kind of celebration that really celebrates nothing. Worse yet is to pretend to celebrate when the spirit of celebration is not within us. One of my favorite stories along this line is found in the book of Esther. Now, if you know anything about the book of Esther, one of the subplots in that whole book, kind of, I say subplot, but it's a basically the main thing. There's a guy in, this, in, in the story of Esther who's like the second to the king Xerxes, and his name is Haman. And he hates the Jews, he despises the Jews, and he's trying to do everything he can to discredit them and kill them and everything else. And so his arch enemy, more or less, is the leader of the Jews, and Susa, a fellow by the name of Mordecai. And uh, the king, king decides one night, he gets up one night and he, uh, while he couldn't sleep and he gets up and he starts reading the, the chronicles, things, the, the, uh, the most recent history. And he discovers that there was a fellow by the name of Mordecai that did something great for him and he wants to recognize him. And so he has the, the people bring, uh, his servants bring Haman in and he says, uh, what should a king do for someone that he really, really wants to honor? And of course Haman's thinking all along, it's me. It's me. He wants to honor me. He, he, just, he wants to do. He said, I take what I do. I dress him up in the king's garments and put on a, a robe and, and a ring and put him on a king's horse and march him through the city and have everybody stand and cheer and everything. And the uh, king's king, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And king looks up and says, all right, I want, you, I want you, Haman, to go do this for Mordecai. Can you imagine Haman leading Mordecai through the city? Here's the guy that did all this good stuff for the. I mean, you know, he wasn't in the celebratory booth, was he? I sometimes watch Price is Right. You watch Price is Right, anybody? And everybody's cheering and clapping and, every, and down deep inside. And you rather, you reckon they're wondering, that should have been me. You know, that should have been me all the way home. I was sitting next to that. They probably just missed my card somehow. Celebration brings joy. Celebration also brings blessings. Uh, Ralph Sproul, some of you remember Ralph who preached our homecoming a couple of years ago. 
a uh, small elderly guy, a good friend from back in North Carolina. He has a great saying. I love this saying. He says, some Christians act as though they were baptized in vinegar and pickled in persimmon juice. And that's certainly true. But the blessings of celebration enable us to relax and enjoy life, don't they? Man, that's a great thing. We just, you know, we go at it pretty hard, most of us, in our work and everything, but celebration is something entirely different. It keeps us from being self-centered and from being selfish. It even brings more celebration. That's why Paul would write to Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Build each other up and let's celebrate. Or one of my favorites... Hebrews 10.25, we we often quote this with regard to people showing up at church, but it's so much more than that. Listen to what what the writer says there, Hebrews 10.25. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I realize right now it's difficult for us to do the kind of in-person encouraging that we would like to do, but there's still ways we can do some. But just think about that, that whole concept of celebration. And finally, we should celebrate because celebrating now reminds us of what the future holds. Oh boy. Oh boy. Can you imagine some of the celebrations that we have that you know, don't even come close to what it will be like in, in heaven? And it's going to be like that all the time. I don't know if we'll be able to stand it. I'll say more about that in just a moment. So, those are some reasons we should celebrate. But what should we celebrate? Well, I, I want to I put the most important one first and last. There's about five or six or seven of these, but I put the first, best, the most important one first and another really important one last. But first thing we ought to celebrate is kind of revealed to us in Luke chapter 15, uh, where Jesus told three stories. He's told, uh, told stories of someone who had uh, lost a, a, a sheep. Remember that? And then he told another story of someone who had lost a coin. A man had lost a sheep out of his block and a woman had lost a coin. And uh, we'll pause there just for a second to say this. You remember in verses 7 and 10 of that text, Jesus made this comment of when the, when the sheep and the coin were found. He made this comment to his listeners. He said, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous persons who don't, do, don't need to repent. What do we celebrate? What should we celebrate? Souls that have been that were lost that have now been found. Now he goes on and tells a third story, doesn't he? Did you, have you ever noticed that the way the third story ends is the way that Jesus said it shouldn't end in the first two stories? In the first two stories, he said when people when when things that are lost are found, they ought to be celebrated. We ought to rejoice over that. Especially souls. And then he tells the story of a lost soul that is rescued by, by some, to some extent by his, by his own decision to return to his father. And what happens? Everybody back home is ready to celebrate except what? One guy. The old brother. Old brother who said, you know, it shouldn't be like this. We shouldn't be celebrating this. We should be stringing this guy up. That's what we ought to be celebrating. But we should be celebrating when soul, lost souls were won. We also should celebrate answered prayer. Oh boy. You know, uh, what a great thing to celebrate. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll find lots of times when prayers were answered, and other places too, but certainly the book of Acts, when prayers were answered, people celebrated. In Acts chapter 12, you may remember that Peter was imprisoned, and uh, when he, uh, he was rescued by an angel from the Lord, and because the church was back praying for him. They're all praying, and, and when he's rescued, he's brought to the home where they're praying. And remember the little little servant girl goes to the door. Her name was Rhoda, I think. And she goes to the door, and, and she says, well, Peter's out. comes back and tells me, Peter's outside. No, uh, uh, that's not happening. The church is astonished. They should have been celebrating answer prayers instead of questioning answer prayers. That's what happens to us sometimes. In addition to celebrating the loss being won and prayers being answered, we should be celebrating, and this is a tough one right here, we should be celebrating opportunities for the suffering of our faith. Oh boy, (laughs) nobody wants to do that. I don't want to do it, but that's what it says we should do. In Acts chapter 5, after the the apostles had had been uh, chastised by the the leaders, uh, 
The Bible says in verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to, of suffering disgrace for the name, the name of Jesus. Can, can, think about it. I, I'm, I'm rejoicing. I'm, you know, I'm celebrating that, that I've been counted worthy enough to suffer for this name. Anybody, I don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but anybody here ever faced a little persecution because of your faith in various venues where you are? When you leave that situation, or it's, it's changed or changes somehow, do you say, man, man, I was glad I was able to do that. No, most of us probably say, I, I shouldn't have put up with that. <laughs> I shouldn't have to deal with that. It shouldn't have been that way. Uh, celebrating what it says. That's why James would write in chapter 1 and verses 2 and 3 of his uh, epistle, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. If nothing else, you're going to gain something out of it. Even if you don't like the idea of having of celebrating, you're going to gain something out of it. In 1 Peter 4.16, Peter wrote, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Wow, how, how powerful is that to, 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 to celebrate opportunities for suffering for one's faith? Runs against the grain, I realize. How about milestones that are accomplished and goals that are met? In second chapter of Samuel, David has uh, taken his army and marched down to the, where the Philistines were because they had taken the Ark of the Covenant. He goes down and rescues the Covenant. And when he brings it back into Jerusalem, remember what he did? He practically strips off all his clothes. And he gets out in front of the ark and he's just dancing around and having a great time. I mean, he's, he's in the celebratory mood. He's singing that cool and gang song, even though it's some three or 4,000 years later. He's singing that song. Celebrate. Have a good time. And his wife, the daughter of Saul, Michael, she's looking out the window at him. And you know, Remember, she's looking out in disgust. And remember, at some point in time, she, she said how, how the, 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 the king really displayed himself today, disgusted everyone. But here's, here was the key. 2 Samuel 6, 16 says this. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. And when she saw king, king David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Michael was a, uh, or Michal, if you want to get the Hebrew, Michal, uh, she was a celebration critic. Now, in 21st century lingo, we call a celebration critic a what? I, I heard it. Party hooper. Why should we celebrate this? Well, David was celebrating. I mean, this was something, this was a big deal. We rescued the ark. Or how about another milestone, the dedication of the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, beginning with verse 62 and following. You can read about that. How about various events? In the Old Testament, one of the great events that was celebrated by the children of Israel was found in Exodus chapter 14, where the, 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 they're delivered uh, from the Egyptians at the Red Sea. How about this one? This is the one I said, I said it was, was just as important, maybe almost as important as the first one. Really a toss-up, but I saved it to the end, and that is this. Excitement and celebration for life in general. That's why I appreciated so much what Marvin and Marty did this morning. Listen to these two verses. One of them we've read already, but listen to this one. Psalm 118, 24 says this. This is the day. This day. This is the day. Not some other day. Not yesterday or tomorrow. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. And be glad in it. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate today. We might not even be here tomorrow. We won't be able to celebrate tomorrow. But let's celebrate today. Philippians 4.4 4 again. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again. Rejoice. Now. Let's turn our attention to the last question. Of the morning. And that is. How should we celebrate? Now. This, this might draw a little bit of comparison here. You might say, well, it's not appropriate to do this, not appropriate to do that. I, I'm not going to pass judgment on anyone else in, in the celebratory uh, part necessarily, but, but how we should celebrate is determined to some extent by what's being celebrated. Doesn't that make sense? There's some things that if, if, you're, if it's big enough, you might do, do one thing and, and some other thing you might do another. But, but I want to mention a couple of things that, to begin with, ways that we should not celebrate. There are two things in the Bible that tell us two ways that we are not to celebrate. 
The first one is found in Exodus chapter 32. Moses had gone up on the mountain to receive the word of the Lord. While he's up there, what's going on down in the camp? The Israelites. Man, they're, they're engaged in that in just about as riotous a living as you can get in revelry, the, the Bible calls it. They just sexual immorality and, and singing and dancing to, and bowing down to foreign gods and all kinds of stuff. I mean, just think about that. Now, we know that's not one of the ways that God wants us to celebrate. I mean, it's just that, it's just that clear. Second thing is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And that, that one deals with rebellion. We shouldn't celebrate with rebellion. Remember Samuel, um, excuse me, Saul uh, had gone and defeated the, uh, the Amalekites. And uh, when he came back, when, he, when Samuel caught up with him, uh, Saul and everybody was having a big party. Just having a big party. They'd, they'd taken uh, stuff that the Lord told them not to take, uh, 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 sheep and cattle and everything, and they're whacking them all up and, and cooking them and, and on the grill, and everybody was getting ready to have a big time. And, Saul, and Samuel says, what's going on here? What's going on here? Rebellion. And I'll read a verse that, that points to that in just a moment. But we should not celebrate either with revelry or rebellion. But the first way and most important way that we celebrate is to give thanks. To give thanks. Even when things are just about as bad as they could possibly be. To give thanks. And that's, boy, that's, I know how difficult that is. We give thanks to God because we know that when we give thanks to God, it helps us develop even more faithfulness to Him, even in the bad circumstances. We give thanks to God because it actually helps us deepen our faith and faithfulness to Him. So it's, it's more of it, and it's more intense, if you will. That's why when, when uh, Samuel called up with Saul and called him on the carpet for what was going on back there in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, this is what it says. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and in sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Celebration's fine, he said, but look, it goes back to what Jesus said before, you know, if you're going to celebrate, one of the first things you've got to celebrate is celebration of obedience. And then Samuel finishes the statement with, to, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. That's why on, on Sundays, when we come to, to worship, we put our offering in the offering plate. That's all wonderful. That's a great thing, you know. Got to pay the bills. <laughs> but besides, aside from that, we, I'm, giving, I'm giving you guys something. Lord, I'm, I'm giving to you. What has our life been the preceding week? You see, uh, Samuel was pointing out to Saul, look, it doesn't make any difference how, much, how many offerings you give. You can burn all the cattle on a thousand hills, and it doesn't amount to doing what God says. So we should celebrate, first of all, by giving thanks. Not only giving thanks to God, but giving thanks to others who have assisted us in so many ways. Instead of criticizing because they haven't done as much as we wanted to do, let's thank them for how much they have done. Uh, young, we got a few young people in here this morning, not a whole lot, but young people. Right now, I know it's a difficult time for you relative to school and all that, but it's a difficult time for your parents and grandparents. Really difficult time for your parents and grandparents. It wouldn't help a young person if you said thanks to mom and dad for trying to get you through, and grandma and grandpa for trying to get you through some of this mess that we're dealing with right now. How should we celebrate? By rejoicing. By rejoicing. Let's all celebrate and have a good time, Cool and Gang said. Singing and dancing, whatever that involves. Shouting, that's a good thing. We also celebrate by giving, by gathering rather with others. One of the best ways of celebration are family and church and friends and community and reunions and homecomings and all kinds of things. And I know that right now a lot of that has been suppressed and we can't do it, okay? I know that that's been taken out of our grasp right now. But the attitude mindset shouldn't be taken out. That should still be there. Celebrating in heart and in spirit if not in presence right now well let's wrap some of this up many people think that heaven's going to be like one long church worship service now if that's true I don't think it is but if that's true 
There, then there better be some major modifications in many church services or people are not going to be that excited to go to heaven, I guarantee you. Well, I don't know if I, after a million years of this stuff, I believe I've had about all I can handle. Okay. We, we, better, we better move on to something else. Remember the words of, of the writer, songwriter uh, uh, Billy Joel in the song, Only the Good Die Young, and he had that, word, uh, that line in there that said, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. And sometimes we're there, unfortunately. We're not people that embrace celebration like we ought to. Tony Campolo, in his book, The Kingdom of Heaven is a Party, said this. There could be no celebration if there's nothing to celebrate. And, that's, and he goes on to say, It is only when people are aware of the great things God is doing in their everyday lives that they have joy to share when they gather together for worship. I want to challenge all of us this morning, rather than thinking of our lives, especially right now, as kind of humdrum, challenge us all to think about next week. Next week when I come, I want to have something really exciting to share with someone else so that will give cause for celebration. Especially in the beginning next week because we're going to enter into a, a period with Job of real depression if we're not careful. Okay? Let's, let's bring something we can say this happened, it was wonderful. And no matter how large or small it happens to be. You know, uh, one of the, one of the uh, practices that started a few years ago that really raised eyebrows, really raised eyebrows in the church, especially in the Christian Church, church Christ in our movement. One of the things that really raised eyebrows was, was when people started clapping, not just in worship, but more specifically at baptisms. That really raised a lot of eyebrows of a lot of people. Uh, the angels do that. The angels do that. Let's celebrate and have a good time. Let's, let's embrace the spiritual discipline of celebration because that's, you know, that's one of the things that will hold us together more than anything else is sharing a celebratory attitude. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Oh, Father, we acknowledge you as the creator of this universe who stood back and, 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 and to yourself and to the Spirit and to the Word who is the agent of this creation. And so, oh, it's so good. I'm pleased with it. It's, it's just good. And Father, we want it to continue to be good. And so we want to do everything within our power to make it so. We want to be the ones that have a positive attitude about uh, in the midst of difficulty and, and great uh, disturbance. We want to acknowledge that we celebrate you, we celebrate life, we celebrate each other, and certainly celebrate your son Jesus who has come to this earth to give us meaning and purpose and to bring salvation. Let's all celebrate, Father, and have a good time. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen.